there's also the the emotional intelligence of being man and that is not being a crybaby not yep. complaining uh, mm-hmm. not making excuses not blaming other people having confidence getting th- things done not asking yep. for a cookie every time you do something good <clears throat> not looking for pats on the back this is kind of the the confidence and the emotional intelligence of a well-adjusted man but if you're addicted to porn mm-hmm. and alcohol and stuff your your mind can't develop to be that for sure and i think that's a good segue um because one of the other things i found in my in my book that people are concerned with is the term that i use that's called effeminacy and you know listen i can't control how people uh, def- define different words in the english language i mean let's just think of a word like you know the word goof Goof, like if I yeah. say you're being a goof yeah. in Canada, probably the States, it's kind of just like an insult for saying that somebody's being dumb in England. And at least from talking to friends from England and friends from Ireland, it's actually in parts of the UK and, and the British Isles in general used to say that somebody is a sexual predator. And the same thing with the word pride. If I say to my son, I'm proud of my son. Hmm. I'm not saying I'm happy that you have demonstrated the capital vice of pride as per like the original <laughs> sin. Right. It's just, I'm, I'm humbled by your accomplishments. I'm honored that how hard you work. We know that we use words differently. Okay. Right. So as far as the word effeminacy, St. Thomas Aquinas defines it. I believe it's in Secunda, Secunda, question 138. Essentially, it's a reluctance to suffer due to an attachment to pleasure. It's a reluctance to suffer due to an attachment to pleasure. There are other ways that people have used the word effeminacy, and that's fine. People can, like I said, but in my book, I talk about effeminacy as being the reluctance to suffer due to attachment to pleasure, and that's the framework that I talk about. So... I was thinking earlier, yes, there are the, um, the big ticket items, you know, addictions, you know, um, infidelity, like there's all those sorts of effeminate things. Cause really what those are is there are things that are pleasurable, but they're unlawful and they're going to hurt you and your family, but you do them anyway, because you're not, you're not willing to suffer the loss of something you want to do for your own pleasure. I saw this guy a, f- a few months ago. I hadn't seen him in a decade or something. I knew him from, from growing up and he's a lawyer now and he was, he's working in Toronto and I live about two hours away from Toronto. So sometimes what people will do is they won't commute cause it's a little too far, but they'll stay in the big city for a week and come home and see their kids on the weekend or whatever. It's, mm-hmm. it's a common thing I get it. And I, I, some people have different situations. I understand that, but he's a lawyer and I know you can make a good living as a lawyer anywhere. Okay. We don't live in like uh, an impoverished third world nation in Canada. There's, there are, you can be the wealthiest man in town being a small, having a small practice in a, in a regular town. And, um, we were talking and the guy just seemed so unhappy. You know, he just got married, had a kid. I told him I had four kids that were four years old and under. He looked at me like I was a you know, crazy person, which I kind of am. And, uh, but he looks so unhappy and he's like, well, you know, I got to work in Toronto because I'll get twice the money so we can buy twice the house. And, and, uh, you know, I see my kids on the, my kid on the weekend and, and I'll get, I'll put five or 10 years and I'll make a name for myself and then I'll, I'll sell my client book or whatever. And I'll come here and I'm thinking, you're willing to give up five to 10 years of being around your child to have twice the money. And once again, he wasn't impoverished. It was like, I want twice the money to have twice the house. Even that we, we wouldn't look at that and say, that's like the Lamar Odom example. But what we have there is a guy who is so attached to the material pleasures, to the prestige, to the name, the reputation, to I'm a lawyer at a big firm in Toronto, that he's willing to forego the formative years of raising his own children in order to materially provide for them, but not provide what is most important, which is the moral and spiritual formation. And that is an example of our reluctance to suffer due to an attachment to pleasure, which is how effeminacy is defined as per Thomas Aquinas and in my book. So what do we say to men a lot of a lot of guys I talked to a lot of young guys talking 18 to 29 getting into 30 yeah a lot of these guys didn't have dads mm-hmm. a lot of them had you know their parents divorced young and then he had stepdad one and then he had stepdad two they have no attachment or guidance or even a relationship with anyone who they would call their dad mm-hmm. and so you know they've been since they're you know teenagers are watching porn and video games and anime and just kind of a big mess and then mm-hmm. they have a conversion right but you know as thomas aquinas says grace builds on nature yes it's not like you get baptized or you get confirmed and then all of a sudden you know you're yep. just this 
you know, St. Joseph upon the earth. Yeah. yeah. So what are some practical things that we can give to these young men who know they're lacking? They're like, look, I'm, right. I didn't have this. And, it, and right. it's not their fault. We can't just be spiritualists right. where I pray 20 rosaries. And Matt Frad talks about this in his research on pornography. People will email him and say, you know, I've done 20 rosaries. Why am I still, you know, and he says, listen, you got to go for a run. You got to go lift some weights. You gotta, so yeah. I have, I have this chapter on Jump in the horse. pool, swim across the lake. St. Francis is easy said that. Look, I mean, physical exercise changes the way you think. It's fact. Yes. Facts. Hashtag facts. Sorry, go <laughs> ahead. No, you're right. And, and uh, also, <clears throat> our body and our, like, we're not Albigensians. We're not dualists. Thank you. We're not, we believe that the body was ordained to be good. And we believe that the soul is the form of the body. Yes. And that your body is a unique body. And your soul is a unique soul made only for your body, okay? Which means if you're going to have cohesion in your spiritual life between body and soul, you have to tame the horse. You have to break in your body in order that it will do what is necessary and be subject to the needs of your soul so that you can achieve great heights in the spiritual life and in the moral life. So this is why we fast. Yeah. There's a reason why when Christ, I mean, there's probably, I'm sure some exorcists and stuff could say other reasons, but one of the reasons why Christ says uh, fasting gets out certain devils is because fasting makes you weak. And the weaker you are, the more you have to depend on God. Mm -hmm. So if you get to the point where you are just like, I mean, you've done fasting, I've had, I've done some, and it's like four in the afternoon and you're just mm -hmm. like, you want to pass out, fall asleep. doesn't matter how much coffee you drink. You are sitting there going, God, <laughs> I got nothing left, mm -hmm. you know, take over. And that's a great, uh, the devil hates humility and subjugating your body and recognizing how weak you are. It forces you to be humble. Right. And that's why we have, and that will in the face of pornography in the face of alcohol addiction, in the face of video game addiction, all these things, even just being soft and not doing what you're supposed to do, you will have command over your pleasures in order to do what is right. Uh, one of the people in the live chat, just his name is Nate noble put his cool. comment on the screen he says my dad left and what helped me leave the effeminate life was exercise and doing hard things mm -hmm. that's exactly what you just said we must do things that we do not want to do because yes. effeminacy is softness that's what it means it's softness mm -hmm. and that is so repulsive in the eyes of women when they look at men and see that softness mm -hmm. the aversion yep. to do hard things this is what being a father ultimately is. Yeah. yeah. It's two kids have stubbed their toes and you have to pick up both kids. Yeah. And comfort them. <laughs> yeah. They were riding their scooters and they ran into each other. Oh, goodness. And knocked their heads. I mean, this, and your wife's having a bad day and she needs comfort. All of exactly. these things happen. I, there's a great uh, a Catholic man, I believe he had 10 kids. He said the moment in the for the modern man, for the modern father, you're coming home to from work, let's just say an average time is 5.34 p.m. You yeah. pull into the back, you get out of the car, and you reach for the back doorknob. Yeah. He said that is the moment of testing because you worked all day. You did your job. Now you're moving into the domestic realm, which is a hard transition for a lot of men. Yeah. A lot of men just go to the bar and drink for an hour and then go home. But you, you grab the doorknob and you turn it and your wife could be there in a dress, yeah. honey, and your favorite yeah. meal could be on the stove and the kids could be daddy, which happens yeah. sometimes and it's awesome. Yeah. Or there could be broken glass on the ground and a kid crying and your wife in tears. You don't know. You don't know. But you have to t put your hand on the doorknob and say, here we go, Jesus, and turn the knob and, and be the man, whatever it is. Man, I walk in my house and like there's like th I got four kids who are four years old and under. My wife could be literally breastfeeding the one child and like the three kids are having a shouting match. <laughs> and there's a plate on the floor and they just and someone just cut the other guy's forehead with his teeth because they were wrestling. <laughs> and it's like I'm not even going to get my suit jacket off for two hours, yeah. you know. And then eventually after supper, I'm going to go, whoo, time for bedtime <laughs> and then back into it, you know, yeah. and that's just part of being a dad. And, but I also want it cause I don't want people to hear us complaining and all that. Mm -hmm. There are moments. And I think if you moments. run your home properly, 
there are moments of the glory where you turn the doorknob yeah. and Joy is there smiling and there's a great yeah. meal and the kids are finishing up some homework or homeschool and they say, Dad, you want to go outside and play or let's go yeah. throw the ball? I mean, those moments, <clears throat> and you, it's those moments where you put in a full day and you come home and the, the domestic situation is, is working, it's going mm -hmm. well, and you're like, man, love being married. Yes. Matrimony is awesome. I love yeah. having a lot of kids. So I don't want to hear, I mean, I don't want uh, you to hear us. If you're a 23 right. year old man who's thinking about jumping into this, I'm going to be a Catholic dad with six kids. I don't want you to hear that. It's always just broken teeth and split heads and no. crying wife. That's not what we're saying. We're just saying that if that happens, you can't come home and be like, oh, come on. I just been working all day. What's wrong? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you still, yeah. we're just saying that you have to be uh, truly masculine to just yes. step up and, and make everything better. Right. You're right. hundred percent.